The Piper Seneca PA-34 has been the most successful light twin aircraft since it was first introduced in 1971. The type is still in production as of 2009, and over 5,000 examples of the Seneca have been produced in various forms, including those built by Polish and Brazilian manufacturers. The Seneca is a six-seat aircraft primarily produced to fill the needs of personal and business flyers who require the added safety margins that a second engine provides, or who aspire to the challenges associated with operating a twin-engine aircraft. It is a testament to its robust construction and detailed design that the type has also found favor with flight schools and air taxi service providers, with hundreds of these operators around the world choosing the Seneca to fill these roles. The original Piper PA-34-200 Seneca 1 offered a maximum cruising speed of 170 knots and a maximum range of almost 1,000 nautical miles. It had two 200 horsepower fuel-injected counter-rotating glycoming engines for added safety. Twin-engined aircraft fitted with both propellers rotating toward the cockpit on the top side do not have a critical engine in the event of having to shut down an engine. Although losing an engine is obviously never a positive event, this does mean that single-engine procedures with a Piper Seneca can be easier to handle than in an aircraft that has a critical engine. It is said that the Piper Seneca is not the fastest, the best looking, or the most exciting twin-engine airplane to fly, but it does these things well enough that it can easily be considered one of the best twin-engine light aircraft of all time. Since this is a technically superior aircraft, about three times the size of most basic training aircraft, it should come as no surprise that this is not the type of airplane that a flying school will entrust to a new student pilot during their initial learning period. But over the years, the Seneca has proven to be an excellent airplane to teach more advanced flying students the intricacies of handling a multi-engine aircraft. This step up would generally occur after the student has demonstrated solid piloting skills in a complex single-engine aircraft, such as the Mooney M20, for example. The Seneca is also an excellent hour-building aircraft that many students and flying instructors use to prepare themselves before launching their airline careers. Although qualifications and requirements obviously vary from country to country and between individual air carriers, the higher the amount of multi-engine hours a person has can significantly improve their chances of landing that coveted right seat with a commercial airline or corporate flight department. The Seneca offers all the challenges found in a complex single-engine aircraft, but adds yet another dimension. Along with a second engine to be inspected, started, and to be monitored throughout the flight, comes the potential of losing an engine which requires a whole new set of skills to handle safely, as we'll soon see on the upcoming training flight. In the hands of a mature student or a seasoned pilot, the Seneca can be a very enjoyable airplane to fly and does not pose any significant challenges to operate safely under normal operating conditions. But if an engine issue was to suddenly arise, it's an aircraft that can eat a pilot up fast if they haven't received the proper training. But there are no such worries on this flight. We are about to experience what it's like to fly the Piper Seneca in the experienced and capable hands of Arna Krutov. Arna is the president, CEO, and chief pilot of Florida Flight Training Center, operating out of beautiful Venice Municipal Airport in Florida. Arna's logbook includes everything from gliders in his early years to heavy multi-engine commercial jets, and his passion for aviation and flight training are obvious to all those that know him. In the training seat today is Sarab Manga, a Florida Flight Training Center student with lofty goals of flying commercially in the near future. He has soloed in the Cessna 152 and Cessna 172 and has proven to Arnie that he has the aptitude and ability to handle the Piper Seneca twin-engine aircraft. Their flight today will deal with some of the special procedures that must be mastered in order to handle this aircraft safely during certain emergency situations. The aircraft that Artie and Sarab will be operating on this training flight is a Piper PA-34200T Seneca II, registered N460TC. 
It was manufactured in 1975, and this version featured improved control surfaces, such as larger balanced ailerons and an upgrade to six-cylinder turbocharged Continental engines. These changes offered improved handling characteristics and better performance, particularly at higher altitudes, as well as an increased maximum takeoff weight of 4,570 pounds. The comfortable passenger cabin features four soft leather seats arranged in a typical airline arrangement. The airplane offers easy access to passengers through a large two-piece rear cabin door, eliminating the need for people to climb over the aircraft's wing to enter the aircraft, as is the case with many other light aircraft. As you'll see, the cockpit seating arrangement offers a huge improvement in space and comfort over the smaller training aircraft in the FFTC fleet, and the cockpit is much more complex, giving our student pilot even more to think about as he transitions to this sophisticated twin-engine aircraft. Venice Airport was built in the 1940s as a military training base during World War II, and after the conflict became a civilian airfield. The airport boasts an ideal location right on the Gulf of Mexico and is bordered by a wildlife preserve, a golf course, and Florida's famous white sandy beaches. It is about 20 miles from Sarasota Airport to the north and 50 miles to Fort Myers Airport to the south. This offers student pilots local uncongested training airspace as well as controlled airspace just a short flight away to help develop radio communications and instrument approach skills. The airport has two 5,000-foot crossed runways offering four distinct approaches. They are runway 1331 and runway 422, each measuring 150 feet wide. There are over 230 aircraft based at the airport and annual movements vary between 165,000 to 175,000 per year, which averages over 450 per day. Aerotopia welcomes you on board for a personal flight training experience to witness and experience student pilot's progress as he makes the big move up to confront the challenges of operating the twin-engine Piper Seneca. we're going to fly to Seneca again. I think we have some seven, eight hours at this point. Uh, you know how to fly the airplane. Uh, you know how to fly the airplane actually quite well. Uh, today I'm going to introduce uh, the uh, VMC again to you and we continue working on the engine failure problems. Today we're going to work on uh, losing an engine in cruise. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about that VMC first, okay? Remember, the VMC is a speed that depends on all these conditions, okay? And uh, we only know that VMC is low today because of the very high temperatures. Um, at the same time, remember that we have turbocharged engines, so they perform quite well even with the warmer temperatures. Um, we're going to be up at our usual 3,000, 3,500 feet for safety. Uh, and remember that we are not looking to find out what the real VMC is today. Especially because the real VMC is probably very close to the stall speed and we do not want to stall the aircraft and set ourselves up for the loss of directional control. Okay. So what we are going to do is slow the aircraft down with one engine not working, producing the maximum amount of drag, okay, and the other engine producing the maximum amount of thrust which will be our 40 inches of manifold pressure. We go to a high angle of attack and somewhere around 80 knots 
75 or 80 knots, you will stop applying the rudder that was not necessary until now to maintain the direction of control. Okay. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Now what is the aircraft going to do after you stop applying rudder pressure? Start banking towards the bank. Yes, exactly. It's going to start losing directional control. So we determine today where we want the airplane to lose directional control. And that will be somewhere around 75, 80 knots. Okay? Okay. You will lose some 10 degrees on the heading and then the proper recovery will be a combination of a reduction of the power on the working engine okay. and simultaneously lowering the nose to get better airflow around your rudder. Okay. okay. So we have more directional control again because better rud more rudder use. And we reduce the force that is causing the aircraft to turn okay. towards the dead engine. Okay. Okay. We then accelerate to blue line for just a moment and use whatever power setting is necessary to maintain altitude, heading control at this VYSE, blue line. Okay. For just a few seconds, then we go into the full recovery or go back to a normal flying situation. Okay. Now, the engine failure today at altitude, I will induce by pulling one of the mixture controls back. I will have the mixture control covered so you are unable to see by looking at the power quadrant which engine failed. Tell me again what the proper procedure is to detect or identify and verify which engine failed. The best method is first to use a common phrase, use dead leg, dead engine. So it means the leg which is not being used to push the rudder to maintain directional control. That usually signifies which is the engine. And you verify that by pulling the, the corresponding thrust lever back to verify whether, it, whether the engine goes off or not. What could you do to be more positive about which engine really failed? Increase the thrust for both the engines. Sure. Okay. You can increase the power and the power of the working engine would require you to use more, more rudder okay. to compensate for the turning tendency. Okay. And it would be easier to detect okay. uh, which engine ha has failed. Okay. Uh, can you think of a scenario where uh, it would be almost impossible or impossible to feel uh, with your legs, which engine uh, failed? Um. How about final approach or during a long descent where your power is almost at uh, idle? Yeah, okay. There would be very little asymmetric thrust. Uh, yeah, okay. There is one thing that will be a good indication where I usually look is the fuel pressure. Fuel pressure. Fuel flow. Okay. okay. Fuel flow, fuel pressure. Okay. Although those will also be a lot lower than usual. So during a descent, when you're almost at power idle, you could have developed a problem in one of the engines and not be aware of it until you need the power again. Okay. So during a descent, we're going to monitor our engines very carefully until we get to lower altitude and get ready for an approach or the landing. Uh, so I will induce the engine failure by pulling one of the mixture controls back. Okay. For me, you don't have to go to full power on the working engine. Okay. If you have uh, sufficient power to feel which is the dead leg or the dead engine, and you vi verify it correctly each time, then that is satisfactory to me. Okay. All right? All right. In addition to that, we will do the slow flight again. We will do uh, the power off stall and we will review the steep turns. Okay? okay. I'll go and let, let's go and do it. All right.
flight school is about 22 miles south of Sarasota, Bradenton, between Sarasota and Fort Myers. So we have two airports right around us for good practices of control towers and approaches when we are doing our instrument flight. Uh, it is, mm, it's back until 5.30, so it's available for 5.30. I don't know. Do right now the cow flaps are in the position check open open okay uh, do you remember what the cow flaps are for okay. and why they need to be in open position uh, for cooling the engine on start do right now the cow flaps are in the position check open open okay uh, do you remember what the cow flaps are for okay. and why they need to be in open position uh, good for cooling the engine on start during the takeoff climb uh, portion of this flight yes. that's right master okay uh, then we turn the master switch off again okay then we check the ignition switches those are on top, the magnetos, check. Yeah, we check them in the off position. Excuse me, the mixture controls uh, idle cut oh, off, okay. they are idle and cut off. The uh, trim indicators are neutral, this is your stabilator trim indicator and this is your rudder, it's neutral also. The flaps are up, when you look outside you can see that the flaps are up and we're going to take off in, with the flaps in the up position. The um, controls free, okay. So let's do that together. Right. Now checking these controls, just like you did in the other airplanes, is an event. So we do it together. So left. in the left turn, the right wing is making the lift, and the left wing is uh, making less lift. And then we go in the other direction. The right turn. Watch your knees. The left wing is making the lift and the right wing is not making lift or is making less yes, lift definitely. okay and then go back to the neutral position then pull the controls all the way back and look behind you and then you can see that the stabilator is moving up and down okay you see that yes all right and then you do a full rudder left and a full rudder right okay yes so the controls are free uh, the pitot and static system uh, you have to drain on the left side there right jack drain okay all the empty seats uh, fastened belts we did that previously cross feed drain do you know where the cross feed drain is behind the the co-pilot seat okay we'll do that in a second um, go ahead and uh, move to the next page then we have the outside, outside the cabin okay we're going outside with the checklist so just uh just hold the manual All right. in your hand and then we'll do a walk around on the outside, okay? All right. All right. Right wing aileron and flap check functionality. Yeah, so check uh, and we check for no ice. Of course, yeah. that's ridiculous. Because uh, in 
Florida heat. There's <laughs> definitely not going to be any ice. No, there's not going to be any ice today. Everything moves a lot heavier than on the small airplane. So put your flat hand if you move it. And check the uh, hinges, connections. Just make sure everything is tight that needs to be tight and moving that needs to be moving now you're going to have to lay on your back all right and you check the connections there is four while you're down there and we're going to check the uh, strut the gear and the tire about three and a half inches in the strut, which is normal. Okay. Don't see any excessive leaks. Excessive? Any <laughs> leaks at all, actually. No leaks? Okay, yeah. and uh, look at the uh, tire also. I think the tire is in good condition. Yes, no no leakage of brake fluid either. Alright. Well, that. Brake pad looks fine. That uh, completes the uh, gear. The next thing is the uh, right wing tip. Make sure that nobody hits something. The lights are there, even though we're not going to use them today. Here we're uh, at the leading edge of the wing, and we have to check for no ice. Um, and of course, we're not going to find any ice today in 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, the fuel cap is here. You open that and you check for quantity. And I usually rock the wing a little bit. So you can also hear, yes. Uh, one of the problems with this fuel system is you only know how much fuel you have if the tanks are empty or full by looking at it this way. Okay. So you probably don't see any fuel, but there's still a lot of fuel in the fuel tank. Yes. Okay. Okay, fuel cap is secured. Okay, now uh, we're going to check the oil. How much should this be? Uh, ideally, we would like six quarts of oil in this airplane. How much do you show? We show about eight. Eight yeah, quarts. Yeah. Maximum amount. Yes. Okay, that's acceptable. Go and put it back. Okay, now we're going to check the uh, propeller usual check make sure there's no nicks in the propeller this airplane of course also has the uh, de-ice boot so you check the condition of it seems visually fine make sure everything is clean looks good your spinner looks good as well okay now we're going to check the cow flap you have to go underneath the engine in the cell again. Make sure nothing is hanging loose there. Seems perfect. All the hinges are intact. Now we have to drain the fuel. So you get your fuel cup. And there are several positions where you drain the fuel. How many does the airplane have? Eight. Okay. This one too. This one seems fine. Okay, if the fuel is not contaminated, there's no water, no rust or anything, no, then uh, I recommend we put it back in the fuel tank. And we look at the uh, nose gear. The whole nose section, the gear, and the tire, you check all at once. No strut one half inches. It's good. Okay, good. Landing lights in front of that. Landing lights is in good. That is the next item on the checklist. Then we check the baggage door. Make sure that is secured, closed and secured. Okay, very well. Uh, make sure the windshield is clean. No bugs, no eyes. Now we're going to the left wing engine cell and the landing gear. So if 
you want to get under engine cell and then look at the strut the landing gear and we have a good tire on this side as well so let's check the oil on this side Six quarts, beautiful. Yes. Right where we like it. Okay. Now on this side of the wing. There's also the uh, pitot tube. Make sure there's no nest in the little holes. Okay. The stall warning vanes for two different flaps. One here. Okay. Shake the wing a little bit. Lots of fuel in there. And then go ahead and uh, drain. Very good, then close the uh, baggage door, yeah. passenger door, and then we come to the back. This is static the port. static port only, static port. one on each side. So the static port is uh, clear, and the inlets for ram air. If you look at the whole tail section, it looks Don't clean. And then the final thing we're going to check here is the stabilator. Now when you use the stabilator, if you want to move the stabilizer, use two hands, flat hands, because you're moving a big surface. Okay. Like hold it right there and distribute your weight over the whole stabilizer so we don't damage anything. You see this, the uh, trim tab or the step moves in the same direction. It's called an anti-servo tab. Okay. Here's the uh, trim device for your rudder or rudder trim. It looks in good condition. And that will conclude the uh, pre-flight inspection uh, on the outside of the aircraft. The only thing we have to do still is remove the chains. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't be getting very far <laughs> after starting the engines. You see in front of you the panel layout of Seneca PA34200T. If you look to the extreme left of the main panel, you have the EGT or the exhaust gas temperatures used for setting the mixture when you're above 3000 feet cruise altitude. We then have the airspeed indicator. Next to it we have the attitude indicator, the altimeter, the OBS or the only bearing selector that's used for navigation. Above those is the gear on safe leg. It usually comes on when you go throttle idle with the gear still up or when the gear is in transition or of course if you have some problem. You then have switches for low oil pressure, for reduced vacuum and for other problems that could come up in flight. It's an indication warning system. 
On the second row of instruments in the extreme left, you have the ADF, or the Automatic Direction Finder. Next to that, we have the turn and slip coordinator and the inclining unit. Then we have the heading indicator, the vertical speed indicator, and the secondary OBS, or OB Bearing Selector. It's been tagged in up or in operated. It's okay for some instruments to be tagged deferred from use. Some of them are not required. The third row of gauges are specific to the engine, the ones off the left control yoke being for the left engine and the ones on the right being for the right engine. Gauge on the extreme left being the ammeter. Next to the ammeter we have the cylinder head temperature gauge, which basically tells us when we need to open and close the cowl flaps for sufficient engine cooling. Then we have the engine oil temperature, the oil pressure, and the fuel tank indicator. The fuel tank in the multi-engine Seneca is of course a little more advanced than your Cessnas or the Mooney airplanes. You have the capability to cross-feed the fuel tanks for each engine. In case for some reason during flight you find that the levels of fuel are not equal. The white switches at the extreme bottom of the panel are the autopilot switches. You have switches for pitch, roll, maintaining altitude, and weight of climb. The white button below the yoke controls the electronic trim. The three engine gauges that you see below the yoke are the three most important gauges for the engine. The left one being the tack for the left engine, or the tachometer for the left engine. The one in between being the manifold pressure for both engines. It has two needles that show the manifold pressures in both the engines. And the one on the right being the tachometer for the right engine. The gauge above the glare shield of the panel is the magnetic compass, of course the basic requirement in every airplane. Below that you have the compass deviation curve. The readings on the compass are highly affected by the electromagnetic field around the airplane caused by the electronic instruments, so you always have a deviation card to tell you the deviation from the readings of an actual compass. Below that we have the radio selectors for putting the radio either on loudspeaker or for keeping them on the headsets and for basic conversation. The three lights you see below the radio selection panel are to be used during pilot's approaches. They light up when you're over the outer marker, the middle marker, as well as the inner marker. Below the radio selection panel you have the advanced GPS, which also has the radios built into it, so you don't need an extra set of radios for this particular airplane. The buttons below the GPS are switches that control the operation of the de-icing and preventive icing boots. They've been marked enough, as you can see, because they're not really needed in such hot weather in Florida. The three lights next to the tag on the right engine are the gear position indicators. Below that is the gear position knob. The red knob is the emergency gear extension knob. The gear in the Seneca is hydraulically operated with hydraulic pressure, so the gear knob does not work. You pull the red knob, which releases the hydraulic pressure and allows the gear to come down. The black, blue, and red knobs in the center are engine controls. The black one being the throttle, the blue ones being the prop control, and the red ones, of course, being the mixture controls. Below that, you have two black knobs, which are controls for alternate air. The handle with the white button on the left is the park brake. To the right of the park brake, you have two knobs, which control the cowl flaps. The button between the radio selection panel and the ADF panel is the avionics switch. This controls all the avionics in the airplane, so you don't have to individually turn them on and off. Next to the radio selection panel, you have the control panel for the ADF, or putting in the NDB frequency, which is also another navigation aid. Below the ADF panel, you have DME, or distance measuring equipment. It basically tells you the slant range, or the distance from the navigational aid, or the station you select. Below that, we have the transponder. Below the transponder, to the extreme right, you have the ELT, or the emergency locator transmitter used when the airplane suffers a traumatic impact or a collision. It gives the emergency services and search and rescue team an approximate position of your airplane. Below the ELT, you have 
four gauges. The one on the extreme left being the hobs or the hobs meter, which is a timer that tells you how long the master has been running for or how long the electrical instruments have been running for. To the right of those you have the EGT or the exhaust gas temperature gauges for each engine. It gives you an idea of the proper setting for the mixture when you're cruising about 3,000 feet. Behind the right control yoke you see the suction gauge or the vacuum gauge. Below the EGT gauges you have the fuel flow gauge. This gauge again tells you the fuel flow for each engine. So you have two needles that tell you fuel flow. To the left of the fuel flow gauge you have two circular wheels that control the lights and the panel lights. To the right of the fuel flow gauge you have all the fuses for the electrical instruments in the airplane. We then have the airspeed indicator. Next to it we have the attitude indicator, the altimeter, we have the turn and slip coordinator and the incline meter. Then we have the heading indicator and the vertical speed indicator. We have two rudder pedals on each side for each pilot. The black portion of the rudder pedals actually controls the rudders. The metal plates control the brakes of the airplane. Differential braking can be used. Getting the airplane to slow down or stop in a straight line, of course, you press both the brakes at the same time. The reason why we want to uh, ha always have a good departure briefing is so there is an uh, agreement to the plan, uh, the normal plan and the plan in case something goes wrong. wrong. Okay, We negotiate that as pilots, we negotiate that. And you should feel comfortable with that and I should feel comfortable with the plan. Okay, And then we work as a team. Alright, here's an example of a good departure briefing. Okay, You're flying a Seneca. Uh, it's very warm outside, um, we don't have max fuel, so we're, we're not at maximum takeoff weight, uh, but because of the high temperature, the engines are not going to perform as well as on a colder day or a standard day. Winds are calm, so we're going to use runway 22. The first portion of your briefing is the taxi portion. Okay, you use the airport uh, diagram. Uh, to look at your taxiways and your runways so you know how to taxi. The second portion is the takeoff with a possible problem. And in my briefing, I usually say something like uh, anything unusual seriously affecting safety of flight, I abort um, when the wheels are still down, when the wheels are up, I'm going to make this airplane fly and we're going to come back to the same airfield. It's VFR, so we can come back, no problem. If everything goes as planned, we go via the such and such departure or visual 1000 and, you know, with an altitude, uh, any questions. That is my typical uh, departure briefing. But the departure briefing is unique and you can make adjustments as needed and today is beautiful weather of course if it's IFR and you're in the mountains the briefing changes a lot okay departure briefing complete any questions not at all okay uh, pre-flight inspection is complete Please. the passenger door is closed and latched okay I'm gonna keep this cabin door open for fresh air the uh, seat belts are on on the right on on the left. left, the breakers are all mm -hmm. in, avionics are off here, the uh, brakes are set, I always set the handbrake, Check. you set the handbrake, fuel selectors are on, Check. they're here, the cowl flaps are open, Check. alternate air is off, Check. mixture needs to be forward, Check. Okay. the props need to be forward Full and the forward. throttle needs to be forward. The magnetos Check. need to be on and the master switch needs to be on. Okay, master on. That's part of your flow. Left engine left right. Right engine left right. Okay. So the four starting engine checklist complete. Check. Let's uh, start the number one engine. Starting number one engine. Clear probe. Put your hand on the throttle and use your left hand to uh, hit the starter button. Keep it, keep the power forward. Okay, go ahead, start it. Don't power back. Control pressure, alternator comes on. Left side, alternator. Very good. Number two, then.
just after I start taxing, I check the brakes, which is always a good habit. Since the airplane wasn't that heavy today, we were able to taxi without adding too much power than about 800 RPM on each engine. as well as most multi-engine airplanes is to use differential thrust for turning more than actually using differential brakes. This way it keeps the brake pads cool and doesn't wear and tear the brakes too much. Since I'm used to taxiing using brakes on the single-engine airplanes, while flying the Seneca, you have to get an idea of how much optimum thrust you need to make a perfect turn. Here are the switches for the fuel selectors, forward being the on, in between being the off, and right behind you have the crossfeed selection. The horizontal wheel you see between both of us is the rudder trim. The one to the left is the elevator trim for pitching the nose up and down. And the rod in between, which is like a car's handbrake, controls the flaps. The flaps in this airplane, as we already mentioned, are mechanical. I'm not performing what's called the pre-departure or pre-takeoff checklist. I start by first putting on the park brake. It involves me running up the engine and checking the various engine indications. Increasing the engine RPM to 1800 RPM, checking the left and right wing needles for each respective engine, checking the alternators to check if they're functioning well and charging the batteries. to look for different indications on the manifold and oil pressure gauges. I'm going to do it approximately twice for each engine. I've successfully completed the pre-departure checklist and we're now ready for takeoff. Taxi 
takeoff checklist. Tornadoes are checked. All tornadoes are checked. Check. 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 Good habit to look for traffic just before takeoff on the arrival and departure side of the runway. It's also important to make radio calls telling other pilots in the air about your intentions, the runway you're using, and what you're going to be doing after takeoff. Check. Ready? Once I'm aligned with the center line, I slowly start adding power to both the engines. I'm making adjustments to make sure that I get the same RPMs out of each engine. Having both the engines with the same RPM gives me better directional control. I don't have to fight with the rudders too much to keep the airplane in the center line and flying straight after takeoff. Mine is not performing the after takeoff checklist. It includes making sure that the gear is up, that the flaps are up, as well as the power is set to an optimum climb setting. I have to increase my throttle to get the same engine output. It's really nice to have a GPS in your airplane as it gives you a good idea of what your exact position is. It also gives you other information like your ground speed, your actual heading, and your tracking. You can also have your flight plan input into a GPS, which tells you what are the headings to fly, as well as what are the estimated times in route. You also have approach modes and direct modes, which allow you to set up your airplane for approaches in the case of an instrument flight.
the single engine airplane to flying a twin engine airplane, you can definitely see the vast change in performance. You can actually now climb at at least a thousand feet per minute, which is a big advantage. You get to your destination much faster, you can climb higher. It's a much better experience flying. about 3,600 feet, Arna is adjusting the mixture control for the engine. For the engine to run efficiently, there's a particular ratio of 1 to 7 for the fuel and air mixture. As you go higher, the air gets less dense, so the ratio changes. In order to keep that ratio constant, about 3,000 feet is recommended to start reviewing the mixture. This way, the engine runs efficiently. You get a higher output of the engine as well as you end up saving fuel. you're cruising or climbing or descending for that matter, it's good to make sure that your engines are synchronized. By synchronized I mean that you have the same RPM on each engine. It gives you better directional control and you don't have to fight it too much. Since the Seneca flies at a faster speed, I make sure that I go a bit farther down south so it gives me enough time to turn to the practice area. I get more room to practice my maneuvers since the airplane covers the same distance in a faster speed compared to the single engine airplane. I'm now demonstrating flight and minimum controllable airspeed. I start by slowing down the airplane, and once I'm in a safe range to extend my flaps, I put the first and the second notch of flaps down in increments. I put the gear down. put my last notch of flaps down. To compensate for the added drag, I have to start increasing the power on the engine. Using the rudder, I maintain directional control and in that way I maintain the same heading on which I started the maneuver. I have not successfully demonstrated the slow flight. I'm not going to demonstrate a power off stall. 
the airplane as you can see is already set in a landing configuration with the gear and the flaps down. I'm going to start a descent at about 500 feet per minute and target an airspeed for approach. Once I capture both of my targets, I'm going to start pitching up or pulling back on the stick. First indication of a stall, I immediately pitch the nose down, I add power, I retract the first notch of flaps and put the gear up. I wait to see a positive rate of climb and an increase in airspeed because I'm simulating an approach to landing stall. The last thing I want to do is to lose any altitude. As I see a ride in airspeed, I continue to retract the flaps until I'm back in a cruise configuration. setting for engine controls in each maneuver are mixture full forward and prop full forward. So therefore during maneuvers I had mixtures on the props full forward. Once I've recovered from the maneuvers and I'm back in the cruise configuration, I'm of course going to change the prop controls and lean the mixture of the engine again. start the steep turns by demonstrating one to the right first and then one to the left. I start that by backing the airplane to the right at a 45 degree angle. I maintain the same altitude by adding or releasing pressure on the elevator. Since I'm backing at a steep angle, I lose some amount of vertical lift. To compensate for that, I add just about 100 RPM on each engine. It's really important to look outside the airplane while doing such maneuvers. You want to make sure that you're looking out for any sort of traffic that might be in the area, as well as looking out for visual points, which give you an idea of your position. You then know when you have to start your rollout to end up on your entry heading. It's recommended to roll out from your turn about 20 degrees before your entry heading. I'm performing the exact same procedure for the left steep turn. I'm backing at 45 degree angles, looking outside for traffic and looking at my ground reference points.
those perfect days for flying. Wind is calm, the air is smooth. We have a few clouds at 2000, but on this flight, we are not even close to being a factor. UMC is the airspeed at which the critical engine is made and operated. It severely affects the control and performance of the airplane. Since the Seneca has comp rotating propellers, that is, each propeller rotates in the opposite direction, we don't really have a critical engine. Therefore, simulating a critical engine is the best that we can get. The BMC speed is an airspeed that is under certain conditions, including temperature and pressure. Therefore, the VMC for this airplane can change from a day-to-day -day basis depending on the weather conditions, etc. The right engine makes the airplane yaw to the left. We correct for this by inputting sufficient right rudder pressure. To complete the VMC demo, after we have put in enough right rudder to compensate for yaw, we start slowly pitching up. We continue to pitch up to about 10 degrees until the airplane begins to bank and roll towards the inoperative engine. The moment it begins to bank and roll towards the inoperative engine, we immediately start recovering from the procedure. The airspeed at which it initially begins to turn, that is the demonstrated VMC speed for the airplane under those conditions. The gear unsafe warning light is on because when you have the throttles in the idle position with the gear up, it comes on just to let you know that your engines are at idle. The procedure for recovery from this demonstration includes pushing the nose down so you get sufficient airflow over the rudder as well as the wings and reducing power on the right engine or the operative engine therefore getting the same thrust out of both the engines again this gives us directional control which lets us recover from the procedure properly Since I do not have a lot of practice on doing VMC demos in the airplane, Arna corrected my mistakes and showed me the correct procedure of doing a VMC demo. The procedure includes cutting the power on the critical engine that you're simulating. Here he's simulating the left engine to be the critical engine or the inoperative engine. The procedure is to simultaneously reduce the power on the critical engine and increase power on the operative engine. VMC demo, he shows me the correct procedure for doing a steep turn in Monty and an airplane, since I didn't lose some altitude while doing my initial steep turns.
mistakes that I made in the VMC demo as well as the recovery procedure. He was telling me of all the instrument indications and readings to look out for while doing the VMC demo. A student will make mistakes during his training period. Making mistakes is okay, but it's important to understand how to correct for your mistakes. Identify and verify the correct engine which has failed. He hides which engine is going to fail for me so that I have no idea which engine to correct for. It's important to understand which engine has failed so you can take the corrective measures to restart the engine. the engines and increase the prop control. This way I know which engine is producing more thrust so as I use more corrective rudder to correct for the engine I know which engine has failed. To verify that the engine I think has failed I pull back the bottle of that engine to see if there are any changes in the thrust or heading with my rudder correction input. advised me to look outside for visual references that I can use so that I know if I'm applying sufficient correction which includes backing the airplane towards the operated engine as well as applying sufficient amount of rudder to correct for the yaw. speed propeller, you should not operate the engine with a high manifold pressure and a low RPM. Therefore, during the simulation, the moment he cuts back one engine, it was a mistake to go full power before going full prop control. He corrects me and shows me the proper way of identifying and correcting for a failed engine. That is, going full prop control forward first and then changing the power. Once I've identified and verified the correct fail engine, the demonstration is complete and Arna slowly increases the mixture of the engine that he has simulated to be failed. I recover by adding power to the simulated fail engine and at the same time releasing the rudder pressure so I can get back directional stability. Arnaz is now demonstrating the proper procedure for identifying a failed engine.
demonstration, I was successful enough to get the procedure properly. He was now satisfied with the execution and the way I do the identifying and verifying of the failed engine. I'm adjusting the prop control again for descent since we changed the setting during our engine failure procedures. I've already slowed down and begun my descent down into Venice. After listening to the weather and deciding that we are going to use runway 13 for landing in Venice, I have started turning to the right into the Gulf to begin the proper procedure. It is also time to begin the approach and descent checklist. Going far out of the gulf so it gives me enough distance to descend down to enter the midfield download for runway 13 at a proper altitude and angle. feet right now and descending down to a thousand feet to enter the midfield downward at a 45 degree angle. slow down the airplane, once I'm established my field down, I'm going to be using the flaps and the gear. Making sure that the safety belts are fastened is a part of the checklist. For a multi engine airplane or any airplane with retractable gear, it's a good habit to put the gear down when you're established midfield down. Yeah, I already have the first notch of flaps down, which helps me slow down. I'm turning base now for runway 13 at Venice. Uh, number 
Flaps to land in airplane usually depends on the pilot. Most of the pilots of the Seneca prefer to use only two notches of flaps, that's 20 degrees as opposed to 30 degrees of flaps. Unlike the single engine airplanes, the approach to landing in the Seneca is always powered. Right above the numbers, I put the power to idle and start pitching up. It's important to keep the nose up as much as possible, so you'll keep the elevator back pressure in there until the airplane's nose really wants to go down. opening the cowl flaps as well as retracting the flaps. Before crossing the runway, we look for any airplanes that might be taking off the landing. safe airspeed for gear retraction. I put the gear up. I make sure that I hold the knob and make a call out saying that gear is up once the three gear lights go off. I also want to make sure that the gear unsafe light goes off.
start reducing the power and adding the first notch of flex. I'm now midfield down there. I'm going to put my gear down so I can begin my descent. base for runway 22. I'm going to continue to slow down and descend at the same time. I make sure that the final approach side of runway 22 is clear. Just like in the single engine airplanes, I'm going to use power for altitude and pitch for airspeed. The moment I'm beating the numbers, I go power idle and start holding the nose up. We're going to be doing another traffic pattern. So the moment we land, Anna puts up the flaps and adds power. There are different procedures for engine failure and takeoff. If there's an engine failure on the ground, the procedure is to go idle on both the engines and apply sufficient braking to stop the airplane. If there's an engine failure after takeoff, it's important to pitch down to make sure that you gain enough airspeed so you can continue your climb. If the airplane is willing to climb at that airspeed, you continue to complete the traffic pattern and come and make the landing. Arna has control of the airplane. He's not going to demonstrate a landing on the Seneca. It's important to make sure that the traffic patterns you perform with the Seneca are much wider. They allow you to square off your turn. If you're closer to the runway, you end up doing racetrack patterns, which doesn't give you enough time to descend, slow down, and plan on your approach. and Arna puts the gear down. We've already started our descent for runway 22. Arna carries out the before landing checklist. It 
it's a simple checklist that makes sure that the props and mixture are full forward and that the gear is down. too early or too high, the airplane can hit the ground hard and it could damage the landing gear. And if you flare too late, you can do what's known as a flat landing, that is landing on all three gears at the same time. That could also cause a significant amount of damage to the landing gear of the airplane. According to announce on radio that you've cleared the runways, other traffic therefore know you are no longer a factor for them. Arna is reading the after landing checklist to make sure that everything has been done, including making sure that the cowl flaps are open, flaps are up, the landing light is off, and the transponder is put on standby. Things like financials are, of course, always there. Having contractual training probably helps you out because it gives you an idea of how much you will actually end up spending for your training, depending on the course that you've chosen. While you're looking for a flight school and once you see their prices, one thing for you to remember is that it's not always about the money, but it's about the quality of training that you get. You should actually consider spending more if you know that the quality of training that you're getting is much better. So it's more important to look for quality more than the price of the school. procedure for the Seneca is exactly the same but you have two engines. You make sure that the avionics are off so you don't damage them and you cut the mixtures. Pull the alternators off as well as the magnetos. Battery off. Alternator off. Cow flaps closed. Blocks checklist complete. Check. Okay good job. You enjoyed flying uh, today? Okay, yeah. it was really good. Um, until the VMC, I think everything uh, was up to standard and went really well. Um, what, what, what I need you to do next time when we do this VMC is know the procedure so well that you can proceed, you can go step by step okay. with, without hesitation. Okay. So next time I will again show you how to do this procedure and then you can uh, you know you can do the procedure after me again okay. all right so that was that was the vmc today uh, now on the engine failure uh, you don't have to rush through the procedure especially when you're cruising we have some time we are flying at 140 150 knots the airplane is going to take a long time 
before the airplane is going to lose so much speed that it is going to lose directional control. Okay. And if we lose a little bit altitude, it's really not a big deal. Take a little bit more time. Okay. When these two engines are running, especially in cruise, and something happens like that, it is because we forgot something or did something that caused, actually caused the problem. Okay. That's one of the possibilities. So that's what we're going to look at is, is perhaps if it was something that we could have prevented or can still fix. And the checklist will back that up. Okay. The Piper checklist, emergency checklist okay. will okay. back that up. Okay. And if you look at the checklist, they will quickly uh, direct you to uh, the, the, the fuel pump. So they want you to check the fuel pressure and uh, if there is a lack of fuel pressure, see if you can restore the uh, situation by using the electric fuel electric pump or the pump. boost pump. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Uh, th of course, there's other things uh, that could have happened. You could have fuel starvation because you ran out of fuel. This is a bad situation because if we run out of fuel on one side, the other side is probably quick to follow. Yeah. So before you feather when you're cruising, which is kind of a final solution here, and it would only leave us with one engine. We want to find out which engine failed. At some point in the near future, we will actually go through the entire checklist and we will even do a full feather procedure so you know how that feels and how it looks. And so psychologically, you get used to it uh, in the event that one day it really happens and you're not timid or scared to feather a propeller of an engine that needs to be feathered. Wonderful. All right, then uh, we'll see each other tomorrow. One more flight. Okay. Right. Hello, my name is uh, Arne Krutov. I'm the owner of the Florida Flight Training Center. Uh, the Florida Flight Training Center is in Venice, Florida, and I started this flight school in 1992. I flew everything from little Cessnas to King Airs and DC-8s around the world. Today, uh, I have uh, almost 12,000 hours of flight time. A lot of times people ask me what it takes to become a pilot. I would recommend go to the nearest flight school and find out. Most flight schools around the country, around the world, have competent people that can talk to you and tell you about all the advantages that aviation brings. So go out to the nearest flight school and find out for yourself. Once you think you have chosen that you want to become a pilot, um, let's first uh, think about where we should go, which country, uh, which area to pick a flight school. I think the most important thing is to look at the uh, quality of the flight training at that school itself. Secondarily, I think the infrastructure is very important and the availability of the material and the quality of the teaching itself. If your choice is to become an airline pilot, it is important to find a school that maintains airline standards big mistake that people make uh, once they start looking for a flight school is they choose the cheapest flight school or the school that offers cheap flight training. The problem with this is that flight training is not cheap. The Avgas or the fuel that we use for our aircraft and the whole support and infrastructure in and around the school, these are expensive things. To maintain quality, to maintain high standards, this costs a certain amount. People in this industry that are trying to bring in students to their flight school by offering not realistic prices for their aircraft and training are not the schools I would recommend. To put this a little bit more in perspective, uh, let's assume you have the choice between two schools and the school you like better cost, has a training cost that is $10,000 higher than the other school that you don't like so much. $10,000 is two weeks or three weeks salary 
by the time you become a captain and can quickly be earned back once we are professionals. A school with poor airplanes that have poor maintenance, bad teachers or a poor infrastructure perhaps has bad meteorological conditions for a big portion of the year will cost in time so much more than these ten thousand dollars that the choice should be to go for the school that is maybe a little bit more expensive but will make you smile and happy every day you come to flight school and will actually give you a good chance to go into this industry be able to earn your salary without too many frustrations the typical course here at the school would be somewhere between six and eight months. This will take you from the private through the instrument through the commercial level. Of course, one would have to do other things after that to be able to get a first job with an airline. But typically after a year and a half, perhaps with a flight instructor rate and teaching for some four or five hours a day, uh, this person would become eligible and we would have a potential chance to get hired by a commuter or a major airline. Which means within a year and a half, this person could start earning money, executing the profession, the job that they dreamt of when they were younger. Uh, another piece of advice to all of you out there, uh, if your choice or your dream is to become an airline pilot, don't let the economy or the market discourage you from going to flight school. The typical aviation cycle is six to seven years where lots and lots of pilots are needed and then less pilots are needed. But the population is growing rapidly. Aviation is still the most popular and becoming more and more popular way to travel. Therefore, pilots will be needed and pilot shortages will become an acute problem again in the near future. If you're thinking about learning how to fly in the United States, these are some of the beautiful things in this country. We have an incredible infrastructure. Every town, every village in this country has its own runways, its own airports where we can fly and airports that we can use daytime and nighttime. These airports at nighttime have lights that we can activate while being in the air without paying anything extra. Landings, we can make as many as we like, as many as we think are necessary to become good pilots at no additional cost. In the United States, we don't pay for the service of airways, the use of airways. In the United States, we don't pay additional money for practicing an instrument landing procedure. This is the only country where services are for the pilots and the whole system is designed and developed to support pilots. This is beautiful, this is unique. Add to that the beautiful country itself with its beautiful weather in most of the country and I think America is an excellent choice to learn how to fly. As a recommendation to the parents of all those youngsters out there that are dreaming about becoming a pilot, that maybe are afraid to talk to you and tell you that they want to become a pilot, please don't discourage them. Please allow them to go to the nearest flight school, to the nearest airport and let them try to fly an airplane. And if this puts a great smile on their face, and if you see that there is this dream, find out the possibilities and what it will take so your son, your daughter can become a pilot. Um, often I get young people contact me who wear glasses, who are maybe overweight, short, uh, tall, or maybe feel that they are not uh, made for this profession. Uh, what we need to remember is in aviation and in the pilot world we look for stable, reliable and loyal people who don't make mistakes 
once they're sitting in the cockpit of an aircraft. But for this, you don't need to be a superman. So every average person coming out of school has a fair chance to fulfill this dream.